Don't ask me to make a video on the Lydian Chromatic Concept since it's a book. You can't make videos on books. So this is the very last episode in the Lydian Chromatic Concept series. This is last episode number 16. It's been a long time, hasn't it, getting here? Uh, I think you all deserve a medal as big as a frying pan for getting this far. Okay, so I just want to go back to this chart and we'll look at these three things. I said style, you've got to know your style of the music you're playing before you add the concepts. Because uh, if you add things that are too far out, it might sound very silly in the music that you want to play. Uh, complexity. I've showed you how to simplify the, the linear chromatic scales into that table that I showed you. And then analysis, which we're looking to do. Before, I want to, I want to show you the analysis of a little tune that I've wrote. So let me show you this tune that I've written. Okay, so this is a tune that I've written out to demonstrate the linear chromatic concept. Uh, it's Band of the Box is not playing this right. The, this, it's not right and right right. That's supposed to be triplets. But if I put it into triplets, that to make it look as though it's triplets, uh, it starts going to a swing, which you don't want uh, a bossa nova to be swing. And I've written this as a bossa nova, right? Uh, it's based on the tune Serenata, uh, which you probably all heard. Uh, And uh, obviously it's a brand new melody. Uh, I'll just show you some, some things you should listen to when I play it for you now. Uh, here we've got uh, sharp 11 on this G mate, which is obviously Lydian. Here I've put mid 7, which is substituting on the scale. Uh, playing ninth on that, so this is just normal playing. Uh, and here we've got this augmented fifth, which is again substituting Lydian. Uh, which is just playing normal vertically, I'm not doing out fancy. Here we're playing a major seven. So I'm doing the same there. I just don't bother putting it in. But this is this will be B minor major seven because we've got that in. But it's off the beat, so I don't have to put it in. It can just put B minor seven. So I'm playing the major seven off the beat, which is again substituting Lydian. Uh, this one here is F natural, right? So it's become flat nine. Um, but I'm also playing a C natural there. It's funny because uh, if you play that as a C sharp, which you would normally get if it was E seven going to to A, you know what I mean? You'd get that being a C sharp, wouldn't you? But it just sounds a lot better as a, a flat, uh, flat, uh, a sharp five, right? More than a six. <laughs> it's interesting in this situation, anyway. Anyway, I'll play you this tune now and let you listen to it. This note right towards the end here, this E7 augmented, that's an augmented fifth there. Yeah, it doesn't sound like an augmented, it sounds very melodic when you listen to it, doesn't it? Uh, let's go back to the beginning. I just want to talk about this bit, Ren. So, th these eight bars I want to talk about, I don't want to talk about the whole tune because it takes me forever. So, there's enough in this first one to show you what's happening. 
if you look at the tune as it's written in G major, you can see that it's, there's all these B's here at the bottom. You know what I mean? There's there's a lot of B's, isn't there? <laughs> so, uh, you know, it, it, it's like repeating B's a lot, and it's, you're going to be hearing that. So, uh, using the linear chromatic concept, you can just alter these notes, get them out of the way, so it actually sounds a bit more interesting. Although this will be simpler, so it might sound more interesting to other people because it's more simpler. Anyway, we'll just have a quick listen to it. Just listen to that then. I, I didn't like this C sharp. It sounds very harsh, doesn't it? Even though it's a 13th on that E7 chord. Right, you've got the 9th and the 13th, so it should actually sound all right. Then you've got here, you've got the th uh, e, you've got the root and the 5th, you know what I mean? It should sound all right, but that sounds harshest to me, to that other chord that I put on, which was E E7 flat 9. Or... Uh, or with a sharp five, you know, an augmented fifth. So that sounded better to me just by altering that. And obviously I've altered some others. Anyway, we'll just have a look at this in severely so now you've heard it. Okay, so this is the two versions of the tune written out. This is how it would be written as a major tune, you know, just following those chords. It sounded quite nice, apart from that C sharp, which I didn't like. Uh, and this is the Lydian a version of it which is a little bit more complicated but more interesting and for some reason that flat that uh, augmented fifth there actually sounds a lot nicer to me you know i don't know why that sound is so nice it's obviously this the way this tune's going uh, so i'll just show you where where these notes all come from right you got g major you got this c sharp work which is different isn't it this is the sharp 11 so this comes from a normal Lydian scale. So if you're looking at it, it's just from this, the Lydian scale, but from G. If you go for G, you go G, A, B, C sharp, don't you? So that's where that note comes from. Here we've got a minor. I'm treating all minors as six chords, whatever I see on here, right? Uh, so this D sharp is the major seven. Now, if you look at the, the uh, table I showed you, look, the minor here, which is six chord, the next one along, going outwards from the diatonic, it is D minor major seven. So the, the notes that's different here would be one, two, three, four, fifth. The fifth note would be sharp because it's the Lydian augmenter scale, isn't it? So looking at this one, if we're looking at it in this kilo, E minor, that's the relative minor of G major, isn't it? Six chord, G, A, B, C, D, E, right? And the, if you're talking about G, right, G Lydian is the scale, then the sharp five, Right, the augmented, which is this scale we're looking at, because we want that chord, don't we? The sharp five would be that, D sharp, wouldn't it? So that's where that comes from. That's where that note comes from, an alteration to that to make it more interesting. We're carrying on just here, just playing a ninth, which I had on the original. Uh, here we're playing uh, augmented fifth, so this is on a seventh chord, isn't it? So looking along, look, we've got this one here. So it's it's on the Lydian flat seven, right? And it's on mode number two. So the scale is Lydian flat seven. So it's the flat seven and wherever the scale is. So it's mode two. Hold on. It's mode two, which is D, isn't it? So D, so the mode would be... So looking at that from mode two, so the, the parent scale would be C, wouldn't it? C Lydian flat seven. And that's the flat seven. That's where it comes from. So it's just one note different, isn't it? Remember, these, these three scales here, there's only one note different. You, you get two notes difference there, look. And then you get more here, more here. But this is the constant nucleus, right? And these are the scales that I'm using in this tune. So that's where that comes from. Uh, G major 7, we're just playing arpeggios now to give some variation, right? And here, again, uh, I'm playing a major 7, which is that, which I've just showed you where that comes from. Okay, so... I'm looking at this chord now. Uh, we've got an E7 flat 9 with sharp 5. It's interesting. You've got this F dropping down half step to E, and you've got this C dropping half step to B. So I need those half steps in, don't I? 
So the only scale that will give me those half steps will be that, won't it? The E7 uh, or and Alt, right, which is actually minus 7, isn't it, right? So we've got those notes in there. Can you see? They're all in there, aren't they? I mean, you can see that directly because it is E7. It's E7 where I'm showing you. So they're all there. Okay, so like if you're playing around with a tune like this, probably the best way to see it is if you see a major chord, just try and look at the extensions that the scales, the new scales make. So if you've got something like this, G, I'll just write it down here. So you've got something like this, G or G major 7, right? The extensions would be like this. The first one is G Lydian would produce an extension like this, sharp 11, right? On that G chord, it would be C sharp. Right, on the on the G augmenter scale, you would get one note difference. Okay, remember, I said there's one note difference between the, the, all the scales in the constant nucleus. And the next one would produce a flat 13. That's what the Lydian augmented thing, and that would be a D sharp from that scale, right? The next extension would be from the Lydian diminished, and it would be a sharp nine, and that would produce a B flat, or a it would be called a sharp, wouldn't it? Not B flat, but that's what that's what the note would look like. So it would really be a sharp, wouldn't it? That'd be sharp nine. And the last one would be the Lydian flat seven. So you're actually giving a flat seven uh, a flat seven. That would be the note would be F. Uh, yeah, it's a F sharp. Okay, so that's that. There would be like the extensions on that. Now you've got a minor chord. E, let's say D minor. Seven. Right, the first extension you'd get. I mean, it'd just be like that diatonic, same as normal. The first extension you get would be sharp seven. So in that respect, it'd be C sharp, wouldn't it? From from D minor seven, right? Uh, and then the next one, say, uh, would be the flat five, which would be A flat. And then the next one would be a flat nine. This would be on the Lydian flat seven. It would produce a flat nine. Which would be uh, E flat, wouldn't it, on that in D minor seven? Okay, that's the best way to see them. Uh, on a seventh chord, so let's uh, what should we make, let's make it? C G seven. So G seven. Actually, we could have said so G seven. Okay. You can have the first one would be sharp eleven. Which would be C sharp, wouldn't it? And the next would be a flat nine. This is from the Lydian diminished, so that would be an A flat. And then the next one would be a sharp five, which would be a D sharp. That would be the Lydian flat seven. So Lydian flat seven on that would be F, F major. So that's E flat, wouldn't it? So G, yeah, E flat, which is the same as D, D sharp. So there you go. Okay, so that's how you, you you could see it faster. That's how I actually saw it. I just looked at it like that and saw those extensions, and then just saw. So then, then when I got into a problem, I actually looked at the table to see see what else I could make. But that's how I, I saw it. I hope you get that that you can actually see things quite fast. If you actually memorise this way of looking at it, looking at extensions as, well, the scales are going to produce a sharp 7 extension, flat 5, flat 9 on a minor chord, right? On any 6 chord. On a 7th, it's going to be a sharp 11, flat 9, sharp 5. And on a major, it's, it'll be sharp 11, because that's the sharp 11, which is natural to Lydian. And then you've got flat 13, sharp nine and flat seven okay so that's pretty easy to remember isn't it so so we'll just have a look now at uh, at identifying bars basically
Okay, so I'm just going to show you uh, how you would write coordinates down. If you were doing like transformation theory, you would first of all write coordinates to tell people what like these this scale is on each bar. Now, I'm not going to go into transformation. That is the transformation between bars because I'm going to be here all day and I want to finish this series off. If people are interested in transformation theory, leave comments below. If there's enough people, leave comments asking me to do a series on transformation theory. I will do, as, as it is in relation to jazz, okay? Uh, but what I'm going to do here is I'm just going to show you the coordinates that you can write out. Instead of writing what Russell did, he wrote all that stuff at the top, the Lydian, you know, at top, which didn't really tell you enough information, I don't think. So I'll just show you an easy, a very easy way to write coordinates to tell people what what's actually happening in these bars, what Lydian scales are being played. Remember, this is just the first eight bars of that little tune that I've wrote out over Serenata. Okay, so what you're doing is you're looking at the collection of notes, right, and then writing down these collections. So this is G Lydian, isn't it, right? We've got G, a G major 9, but we're not in a mid scale, we're in Lydian because we've got this C sharp, because G Lydian A has got G, A, B, C sharp, D, E, F sharp, G, right? Uh, what I'll do is I'll actually write the scale over the top in this cantage. I want me to see this, but you will when I finish the video, right? Right, what you're doing is you're taking the collection of G Lydian and you write the coordinates down, right? What is the coordinates of G Lydian? What is specific about it? Well, the collection of G Lydian, right, is two sharps, isn't it? So the first coordinate is two sharps. That's telling you that you're in Lydian. G Lydian, sorry. Right, and now we've got to know what the scale is. Now, if you look on that table I showed you, if you look on this table, what we're doing is we're looking at this part here. I mean, I know this is written out in F Lydian, I was just trying to show you, but imagine this is a G Lydian, right? It would be here, this diatonic. Now, what is the diatonic coordinate? What have we said? Well, when I listed them, can you remember the table? The coordinate was zero. This is telling you that it's the Lydian diatonic. So let's write that in. So they've got, instead of writing all that stuff down that Russell did when he was writing Giant Steps, can you remember when I showed you in the other videos, and it would just completely mess that. All you've got is just a little thing like that, and it's telling you exactly what that bar is. Two sharp means you're in G Lydian, and it's obvious because you've got that C sharp there. And what, G Lydian what? Well, it's a diatonic because it's zero, right? So I'll just do, I'll just finish these eight bars off and show you, and you'll get, you'll get it at the end. Now, normally, you would put, there would be a function here, right? Mathematical function that's telling you where this music is going, how it's progressing. And it is actually, it is, it's useful information, but it's actually beyond what I can teach you in this, right? Because this is just a critical review of George Russell, not a, not a, not a thing on teaching uh, transformation theory. If people are interested in transformation theory, like I said, leave comments below. If there's enough comments below and enough people are interested, then I'll, I'll do it. Because it does take a lot of time making these videos. I don't wanna really want to do it if people are not that interested. Okay, so this bar here, well, what is the scale? Well, it's obvious, isn't it? That is chord six. Let's write that at the top there. That's chord six of this. Remember, I'm treating all minor chords as six chords. So it's still, we're still in G major because G, A, B, C, D, E. Right, it's chord six. So we put down two sharp. We're in G Lydian. That's the parent scale, right? And what is the, what is the actual uh, Lydian scale we're doing? Well, if we look at the chart again, we use this, didn't we? Which is the Lydian augmented. And what's the Lydian augmented? The Lydian augmented is called number one it's number one scale isn't it so just here we write number one can you see how quickly can I identify that two sharp is G Lydian and one is Lydian augmented because that's how I've done it out so let's have a look at this one again we're looking at this as chord six right what's chord six well chord six uh, a, a minor is obviously C Lydian what is C Lydian right C Lydian diatonic, we talk about, well, C Lydian has got an S sharp, that's it. And the diatonic, I've just said here, is zero. So that's the coordinates for that one. Right, so now we've got this D augmented seven. Now, where does that come from? 
it's a it's a seventh chord, so it's obviously on C, isn't it? If it's if it's if it's seventh chord, if it's chord number two, so it's on C. So we've got the same thing. And an augmented chord, where's that belong? Let's have a look at that chart again. So we're here, we're on chord two, so we're looking along here, and we're there, look, see? Augmented fifth, so it's a flat seven. What is flat seven? Flat seven, I've said, is three, chord three. And we write that down. That identifies that bar. Tells you where that augmented chord's coming from, you see. Right, going back down here, well, basically, this is the same as this, so we can just write it in. Uh, talking about Lydian, so too sharp. G Lydian. Diatonic. Okay. Uh, what about this one, C9? Okay, so this is interesting. If you've been watching this video from beginning and paying attention, I've just called this, I put a little note at the top and call this, sub 5 7 of 3. Now if any of you have been watching my harmony videos and you, you're really into it you will notice that that's wrong. That cannot be sub 5 7 of 3. Why? Because we are in G, right? If you're looking at it in G major or whatever and all substitute dominant chords, right, have, even though it's that's dropping down a half step which it should do all substitute dominant chords have to have a non-diatonic root, and that is diatonic, right, to G major. I'm not talking about C, G Lydian now, we're talking about G major. So that is operating more as a tonic chord as we're going along, okay? So the actual uh, scale for this would be C Lydian, right? Let me just show you on the scanner thing. It would be C Lydian here, and then you would have to look along... Right, and it would be that one, the flat, flat seven. So the flat seven is three. So C Lydian three. So C Lydian is one sharp, and it's the third scale because it's a a ninth chord. Because we want that B flat when we play B flats. So although here I'm I'm avoiding it right, and I'm playing uh, the F sharp, okay, which is obviously Lydian, C from C Lydian into it. Okay, uh, so then we're into this one. Remember, we're cheating all these minor chords as six chords. Well, I am anyway. <laughs> uh, so let's have a look at this one. Okay, so this is the sixth chord of D Lydian. So we'll write that down. So D Lydian would be three sharps. And what's the scale? Well, it's a major seven because I put that in, didn't I? And we've already said here, look, major seven. So major seven because we've got that A sharp in, and we've already said that major seven would be one, right? So put that in. You can check this yourself on your own chart. That's right. And now we've got this uh, interesting one here, which I'll just show you where it came from. So we're talking about this chord here, this E seven. So it's on it's on F Lydian. It's actually on this chart. So it's F Lydian, which is uh, key thing should be natural. Natural. It's on two scale two. Okay, so that's how you basically put the coordinates in. Like I say, you can go, you can go a lot more into this and show a lot more information. But that that is showing you basically what Russell did by putting all that stuff at the top. But it's so simple and nicer. You know what I mean? You can just glance at it and see what's happening. Okay, so that's about as much as I can t show you about the Lydian chromatic concept without going into really technical detail about transformation theory. Okay, so to finish off our brief biography and see what happened to Russell after 1953. With the Lydian chromatic concept in place, Russell turned again to writing, this time for smaller combinations of musicians schooled in bebop and modern jazz. While working at a Greenwich Village drug counter in 1955 and living in the Bowery, he received commissions from Teddy Charles and Hal McCusick. Charles Tentet recorded Lydian M1 in January 1956 for Atlantic Records and McCusick's quartet recorded The Day John Brown Was Hanged and Lydian Lullaby in March 1956 for RCA Victor. 
A third composition, Miss Clara, was recorded under McCusick's leadership by an expanded octet. With the success of McCusick's first recording, Jack Lewis, producer and a and man for RCA Victor, signed Russell to a contract for production of a Jazz Workshop Series LP under his own name. Lewis gave Russell a sizeable advance that allowed him to move to a better apartment and continue composing. For this new project, McCusick's existing quartet with guitarist Barry Galbraith, bassist Milt Hinton and drummer Ozzy Johnson was augmented by Art Farmer and Bill Evans, both still new to jazz listeners at this point. This produced the famous Jazz Workshop album of 1956 and took over a year to make over three sessions. Russell worked during 1956 arranging for singer Lucy Reed, a Chicagoan with whom he was acquainted. It was Reed who introduced Russell to Bill Evans. Russell also arranged other pieces for McCusick's quartet, as well as the Hal McCusick's Art Former Quintet, during this time. From this point, his compositional activities in the sextet model continued in full force for over a decade. Following the successful completion of the Jazz Workshop, Russell was commissioned to write a multi-movement work for the 4th Brandes Festival of the Arts in 1957. The new work, All About Rosa, appeared on a programme that included works by the jazz-orientated Jimmy Jufre and Charles Mingus, as well as the classically orientated Milton Babbitt, Gunther Schuller and Harold Shapiro. A recording of All About Rosa, along with works from 1956 by John Lewis and J.J. Johnson that featured Miles Davis, was later released on Columbian Records in 1996 and hailed as the birth of the third stream. In the fertile period that stemmed from the Jazz Workshop, he was signed to Decca Records and wrote music for his 1958 album, New York, New York. The new album featured an all-star orchestra including John Hendricks, John Coltrane, Benny Golson, Art Farmer, Doc Severinsen, Bill Evans, Milt Hinton, Bob Brookmeyer and others. The new compositions do not extend Russell's style beyond that of the Jazz Workshop or All About Rosie and in some cases borrow material directly. This period also saw the publication of the second edition of the Lydian Chromatic Concept which was more widely available than the 1953 edition. Russell's second orchestra album for Decca was Jazz in the Space Age, 1960. This album represents a shift of direction, incorporating freer, out-of-time improvisations by pianist Bill Evans and Paul Blay between written movements. Freer improvisation would gradually become more prominent in Russell's music. Russell then returned to the small combo format and led his first working band, the George Russell Sextet, for many years. The first group began in the summer of 1960 and was heard on George Russell Sextet at the Fi Spot, Stratifunk and other albums with evolving personnel. The group was initially made up of players from Indiana University who Russell had taught at the newly formed Lennox School of Jazz in the summer of 1958 and 1959, including Russell devotee David Baker. This group effectively launched Russell's sextet, which would remain active for 20 years. Leading the sextet became Russell's main musical focus in the early 60s. With changing personnel, it produced more than seven albums. In 1964, Russell published a third edition of the Linear Chromatic Concept, adding several new essays and developing the River Trip explanation of tonality, which compared the different approaches to the tonality and chord changes of Coleman Hawkins, Lester Young, John Coltrane and Ornette Coleman. After an appearance at the 1964 Newport Jazz Festival, Russell's group began a European tour in July of 1964, Following this tour, Russell moved to Sweden and then Norway, where he remained for five years. Russell was dissatisfied with the relative lack of opportunities available for his adventurous sextet in America. Europeans were interested in his music and public institutions were willing to fund large-scale projects through grants and fellowships. 
In Europe, he found a very receptive group of talented musicians who performed his compositions and brought their own European perspective to improvisation. Russell established connections in Europe that he would develop for the rest of his life. He would often tour there. Russell settled in Sweden and Norway, where he was able to find quality musicians who were interested in new forms of improvisation and who were inspired by both old and new American jazz, but also by European classical and folk traditions. During this time in Europe, the development of the sextet involved Europeans such as Jan Garabak. During his time abroad, Russell taught the Lydian concept at Sweden's Lund University. Radio Sweden commissioned the solo guitar piece Concerto for Self-Accompanied Guitar, 1967, recorded by Rune Gustafsson on classical guitars and composed Othello Ballad Suite, Time Spiral, Vertical Form, Now and Then and Freeing Up. In 1968, Russell recorded solo organ music in a church in Oslo. While staying in Oslo in the spring of 1969, Russell was hired via telegram by Gunther Schuller to teach at the newly formed jazz department at Boston's New England Conservatory of Music. After negotiating via telegram and letter, Russell returned to the US for the fall semester of 1969. At the New England Conservatoire, he taught the Lydian concept and performed other duties for an annual salary of $9,000. An important commission and collaboration came in May 1972 when Russell was hired by Bill Evans and Columbia Records to write for Evans' second album for that label, Living Time. Russell's return to America was noticed by many critics and cultural institutions and he began to receive awards and grants, including John S. Guggenheim Foundation Fellowships. These awards allowed him to continue touring and recording with large ensemblers and to work on a new expanded fourth edition of the Lydian Chromatic Concept. In the late 1970s, Russell established the New York Big Band, the group later evolved into the Living Time Orchestra, which would be Russell's preferred professional ensemble for the remainder of his career. The Living Time Orchestra was assembled to play the large work African Game, which was commissioned jointly by the Swedish Broadcasting Company and the Massachusetts Council on the Arts and Humanities. It was premiered in both Stockholm and Boston in 1983 and Massachusetts Governor Michael Dukakis proclaimed March 22nd George Russell Day. The June 18, 1983 recording of African Game was released by Blue Note Records and African Game was nominated for a Grammy for arrangement and big band performance in 1985. Russell received the prestigious John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation Fellowship in 1989. The Living Time Orchestra made a tour that included a stay at Ronnie Scott's Club in London in August. This music was released on label Blur and the Living Time Orchestra continued with albums and tours through 1995. Russell's major fellowship support finally produced a definite fourth edition of the Lydian Chromatic Concept in 2001, with the subtitle The Art and Science of Tonal Gravity. The updated edition included many new analyses and chapters written by Russell and those who assisted him in the project. Russell was elected a foreign member of the Royal Swedish Academy of Music, named an NEA jazz master and reached distinguished emeritus faculty status at the New England Conservatory, retiring completely from teaching in 2004 at age 81. He and his wife, Alice Norbury Russell, were long-time residents of the Jamaica Plains neighbourhood of Boston. After suffering from Alzheimer's disease in his later years, Russell passed away July 27, 2009. I think the first thing to say is that Russell's Lydian chromatic concept stirs up different emotions to different people. To those who don't understand it and find it difficult to comprehend, it is simply dismissed as eccentric rambling. These type of people have their prejudice reinforced by the writings of Jeff Brent, Hal Galper and others. Then there are those people who hold Russell in esteem, not because they understand the concept, but because of Russell's work as an arranger-composer 
an influence on other major musicians of the 1950s, most notably Miles Davis. In his video entitled Music Theory and White Supremacy, Adam Neely states that the Lydian chromatic concept can be used to analyse other types of tonal music other than jazz. However, in an earlier video on the near-forgotten original music theory of jazz, he describes the concept as a stumble along the way in jazz education. I would consider the Lydian chromatic concept like a stumble along the way in jazz education. Which seems to me a bit strange, recommending it on the one hand and criticising on the other. It reminds me of the Chinese proverb, one does not insult the river god while crossing the river. Another interesting point about the Lydian chromatic concept is that it rarely gets any credit for originality in music literature for inventing chord scale theory. I have never seen any Berkeley book state the origins of chord scale theory as belonging to George Russell's concept. It is almost as though he has been erased from history. One of the main sticking points of the concept is both its proprietary language and expense. The concept is difficult to understand and very expensive to buy. The cause of this is, I believe, how it was originally intended. Russell's first draft of the concept was simply to hand around to musicians for feedback and was not distributed widely. So initially, only musicians in his immediate circle would get to see it. After encouraging feedback from this group, the first true edition of the concept came out in 1959. The price reflected both the purchase of the book, but also included some personal tuition lessons from Russell himself, hence the price, and probably the way it is written. I think Russell envisaged the book only as a study text, and having lessons from him was part of the package. This philosophy most likely still holds, with lessons expected from the experts endorsed by Russell himself, which I am certainly not, so consider that now you have watched this series. I think one of the main criticisms of the concept is that it is nerdy and its advocates want to keep it that way. After enduring threats from members of the concept's Facebook page, I kind of agree with this assessment. The Lydian chromatic concept will never become widely known if people treat it like a closed shop not to be discussed in public. This also will send more people over to the Jeff Brent Hal Galper camp. So to conclude this series, I would advise you to check the book out for yourself and make your own mind up as to whether it is useful or not. From a personal viewpoint, this journey has been rewarding. Even if you never use it, Russell's concept should be something anyone who is interested in jazz should know about, even if only at a basic level. I use many resources to make this series, but special mention should be made of Peter Kenage's dissertation of 2009 and Michael McClimmon, whose slides I use for illustration purpose and whom's 216 transformation dissertation I quote frequently. I hope this series has helped you understand the leading chromatic concept a little better and I hope to see you in the future. Bye.